Good evening, and welcome to Colorado Decides, a joint production of Colorado Public Television, CBS4, and News Radio KOA. I'm your host, Dominic Dizzuti. Joining me is Sean Boyd, political specialist with CBS4, and political analyst Eric Sonderman. Tonight, we look at the Denver mayoral runoff race to be, cited, to be decided on June 4th. Joining us for the next 60 minutes are the challenger, Jamie Gillis, and the incumbent, Michael Hancock. Both of our candidates, thank you so much for being here. We're Absolutely. excited to be the first debate out of the shoot uh, for this runoff <laughs> campaign, so thank you for being here. Uh, Sean, we have limited time, so let's get right to it. Why don't you start us off with the first question? Thanks, Dominic. So growth seems to be the overarching issue in this race, whether you're talking about traffic, housing, or just the overall cost of living. Gentrification has really transformed once affordable neighborhoods mm -hmm. in this city, and Denver has become ever wealthier and ever whiter. So how do you accommodate the growing population while not displacing the current one? And Jamie, I want like you to start here. Yes, it's an excellent question. And I think it's important to recognize the role that um, city government really plays in, in their policies through planning, through economic policy, and how our neighborhoods transform. And you can look at policies going back decades that have continued to shape neighborhoods today. And looking at where gentrification is occurring is largely tied to redlining policies that date back well into the early 1900s. So if we really want to shift that dynamic, we have to be willing to engage with those neighborhoods and communities and address their unique needs. Each neighborhood use, needs a unique toolbox. We need to use zoning as a method to protect displacement. We need, need to use economic policy and economic strategy and be willing to invest in those communities in different ways. Ultimately, every community needs access to transportation, to parks, to good schools, to, to food, to healthy food, to grocery stores. And until we're willing to look neighborhood by neighborhood and ensure our neighborhoods are healthy, we're gonna to continue to fail as a city to have a truly healthy city for our people overall. And Michael, I think in some neighborhoods, West Denver, for example, you've got people saying, don't come in and fix up our neighborhood yeah. because I'm afraid you come in and fix it up and it'll become too expensive. So how do you balance this? John, you ask a very good question because you know the reality is I was in, uh, having grown up in a city, I've watched neighborhoods shift. Five Points, for example, that I grew up, we saw it start to shift in the 1990s. Curtis Park, maybe a little earlier, started to shift. Montbello, my wife and I, Mary Louise, bought our first home in 1993. We started to see Montbello shift in the early 1990s into the mid-1990s. And so we started seeing neighborhoods shift. And so it's always been an interest of mine. I um, was in West Denver recently where we decided to fund the building of a new rec center. And I'll never forget one of the residents coming up to me with tears in her eyes saying, please, don't build this rec center, it's gonna change our neighborhood mm -hmm. and I'm gonna be forced out of the neighborhood. And that's a tragedy when people believe that you cannot improve their neighborhood and, and avoid displacing them through gentrification. In 2012, I commissioned a task force inside the city of Denver to take a look at gentrification in our city. I started as a long-term resident of Denver seeing neighborhoods shift and I wanted to know why. And what we learned was some startling uh, information. One, the city is the first to see um, those things that might trigger gentrification. For example, private developers filing permits, the public going in, the public government going in to build rec centers, pools, whatever, um, may trigger gentrification. Transit lines coming through may, may trigger gentrification to ultimately lead to displacement. So what we've done is we've designed this nest effort that is designed to see those things, identify and assess vulnerable neighborhoods and then move in with the multi-agency efforts to try to protect and to guard against gentrification that ultimately leads to displacement. But we gotta be very honest, gentrification and displacement, ultimate result is d d displacement. These are long-term systemic challenges that occur. And so they're, sometimes they're so slow that the pe people with a naked eye don't see them. Uh, and, but as a local government, one of the things that we can do to help our residents is to be mindful, attentive, see those things and move in faster. We could have done it in Five Points and Curtis Park back in the 1990s, but not everybody understood what are those things that cause gentrification but we have a better understanding now, and hopefully we can continue to buffer it and to protect neighborhoods and vulnerable residents. Eric, can we have our next question? Sure, let me just start very general. We'll get specific as more specific as the hour goes. We'll start with you, Michael, on this one. How is Denver a different city four years from now if you're the mayor for those four years as opposed to the person sitting next to you? Well, Eric, I'm gonna say this now. Denver's a much different city than it was when I became mayor in 2011. We found a city mired in the recession in a lot of trouble, close to 
uh, single digits in terms of savings account, people almost double digit unemployment, no hiring of police officers, firefighters, we weren't filling potholes, we weren't watering our parks. Today we are uh, arguably the most economically vibrant and thriving city in the country. A lot of the mechanisms that we put in place to manage our growth um, will, are, are taking hold really now and will really thrive in the third term. It's one of the things that got me most excited about running for a third term, quite frankly, was that all the mechanisms and, and tools we put in place in terms of funding our housing, affordable and obtainable housing, addressing our congestion around our mobility and infrastructure, um, addressing really the quality of life issues that we all care about and makes Denver our great city that we want to live in um, are taking hold now but really will thrive in the third term. Government unfortunately sometimes is slow and it takes time for us to kind of understand what's happening, react to it, and put in place those mechanisms to respond to it. But I'm going to say this very clearly. I would much rather, as mayor of this city and as a resident of this city, as a lifelong resident of this city, manage the challenges of growth than to manage the challenges of a dying city. And today we are a growing, desirable city, and we have a lot of tools in which to bring to the challenges that we face as a city. And in the next four years, you're gonna see more affordable housing, more attainable housing in the city of Denver, built around transit corridors. You're gonna see healthier kids because they are able to access the services of the city much better. Um, you're gonna see much more technology deployed to, uh, to manage our mobility challenges in the city of Denver, as well as many more options uh, in terms of uh, mobility around the city of Denver. And I hope and I plan on this being the best city in America to live, uh, to raise your family, and to build your future. And Jamie, if it's four years into the Gillis administration instead of 12 years into the Hancock administration, mm -hmm. how is Denver a different place? Well, I think we can only be a great city if people can afford to be here. And if they find that the quality of life is extraordinary here, that's why people want to be in the city. That's why people have come here and tried to stay here. But that's the challenge, and I think to, to say that in eight years of solid economic growth, we have just, it came too fast, and we have not been able to, um, to keep up with it is, is a fallacy. We've had mayors who in eight years of budget declines have done way more for the city in terms of investing in things that for the long term benefit Denver. And that's where we need to move, and we need to move quickly. We have done a lot of planning, yes, but we should have been doing as we were planning. My vision for Denver is that we need to refocus on that extraordinary quality of life, healthy and strong neighborhoods, and a city that serves all people. We can and will continue to grow, but it's not scattershot growth and density. It shouldn't be growth dictated and directed by the development community. We need to manage that growth strategically. We need to invest in transportation, we need to protect our parks. We need to look at the affordability issue, and it's affordable housing, but you know, property tax assessments just went out the week before the election, and people are seeing 30, 40, and 50% increases yet again. Our residents, our small businesses are struggling to hold on here, and you can't look at our economic growth and say, look, we have a great, strong economy. People forget eight years ago how bad it was because it's bad for a lot of people right now too. And that's what we need to address. The disparity, the inequity, and creating a livable city for the people of Denver. I'm gonna take this next question. Jamie, you'll start. Our friends at AARP helped make this debate possible and they have submitted this question. Some of Denver's growth pains are particularly challenging for older adults. What additional steps would you take to increase the availability of affordable housing and transportation in order to foster the ability of older residents to age in place and thrive in the neighborhoods they call home? And I'll add to that question that we were talking before this debate, there are folks in neighborhoods that may have bought that house 50 years ago yeah. and they want uh, to continue to live there but now face property taxes as you referenced. So how do you help uh, maintain that community for the older adults in Denver? Well, I think you said a couple of really important words there that I hear a lot when talking to our older population, which is maintain community. The, the, the uh, growing aging population in Denver feels very disconnected from what's happening in the city. So it's, it's a multitude of things. It's one about how we reconnect them back into our community. And it is, second, how do we acknowledge the challenges that that people have living and moving in Denver. And I think part of it is, again, going back to how we help build, strengthen our neighborhoods and make sure that our, our neighborhoods serve the population where people live. Because a lot of folks don't, they do want to age in place and they can. 
but they need to have services. They need to have access to transit there. Um, the transportation piece is hugely important. And I think it's one of the biggest failures of the last eight years that even as we saw growth coming, we weren't investing in addressing intra-city transit to move people around. And that's a huge priority for me in a new administration is to get moving as fast as we can on a connected network to move folks. Uh, but we also do have to address the affordable housing challenge. Um, and that's a partnership that is going to be well beyond the city of Denver, although they're a key player. And it's not just about resources, it's about permitting and partnerships and how we use our land and assets to advance that as well. But I think at the end of the day, it's again engaging with that community and it's more about, more than just about having access to rec centers, which I think was a great move by Mayor Hancock. Um, it's more, more about how we look holistically at how people are living their lives and the fact that this is an incredibly important, important population for our city. Michael, same question, helping yeah. the older adults in our community in Denver. You know, Dominic, one of the things I'll tell you that in, in forming policy, I oftentimes look at my own life and the people in my life and, and really how they're dealing with certain situations. So I start with my 80-year-old mother, Charlene, uh, who is now a renter, um, but I also watched how she became overburdened with rents. And part of our affordable housing strategy is also absolutely today, not in the future, or planning to address the issues of uh, our older adults in Denver, Colorado with regards to access to affordable and the ability to afford, quite frankly, their housing. I've sat with our aging commission. I've understood, come to understand through my mother and the aging commission, really the challenges that older adults are facing. So here's what we've done. One, we, we partner with VO, Volunteers of America, for example, to build housing that is directly uh, focused on our older adults in Denver, Colorado. Uh, we've been able to produce several hundred units and we hope to produce even more going forward. They're very much a part of our efforts around affordable housing in Denver, Colorado and some, with some of our development partners who are out there who form housing for our uh, uh, older adults. Secondly, we have stepped up our game in promoting and making sure our older adults, as well as part of my budget, I've increased funding for our property tax relief program. Uh, it's very important that our older adults know that those resources are available to them to make sure that they're able to buffer themselves from these increased valuations and ultimately increase in their property taxes. In 2019, not only did we continue to fund that and increase the funding for older adults, but we also extended it to low-income families and children in the city of Denver. And then Jamie pointed to the fact that uh, we, uh, we made our rec centers available to our older adults. Quality of life for our older adults and really guarding against isolation is equally as important as well. My mother, in a conversation with her one day, lived across the street from a rec center. And I said, Mom, I want you to go across the street. I want you to get more involved. You know, they're taking trips. They go up to the mountains. They're doing arts and crafts and ceramics and what have you. And she says, I, I can't afford to go on that rec center. That membership fee is too high. I went back to my office and I said to the team, I want you to find a way, just as we did for our young people, to give access to our rec programs to our older adults. And they came back having designed the My Denver Prime. We have increased five times the number of seniors who, and older adults who have access to our rec centers. Again, guarding against isolation, hopefully providing a better, higher quality of life for them. Sean, you're up for the next question. Thanks. So, this one is for both of you, but I'll have some separate question for you, Jamie. I'll start with Michael. I want to talk about some perceived conflicts for mm -hmm. both of you. Michael, Colorado Public Radio, as you know, did some extensive reporting on your relationship with lobbyists, some mm -hmm. of whom work for the city while also representing corporations that have lucrative contracts with mm -hmm. the city. And CPR noted, you know, you've dined, you've traveled, you've accepted donations from the lobbyists, mm -hmm. tens of thousands of dollars in gifts from some of these corporations. It's all legal. Is it right? You know, CPR also noted that we have had, they found no wrongdoing. They yeah. found no inappropriate actions on my part, on the part of my team. Um, it's just, they, can, they, 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 they noted the close relationship that I have with lobbyists. Sean, I've grown up in this city. I started my career in this city, raised my family in this city. Um, I'm in politics, have been since the age of 13, uh, volunteering for campaigns. I've known a lot of these people way before I became a politician. I do not hang out socially with lobbyists who lobby me. If we're hanging out, we're doing it because we're personal friends and we were before I was elected. Let me be very clear. I have relationships with people across almost every sector in our marketplace today. Um, this was something that the, that the CPR report decided, decided to zero in. He said he got a tip. But as he looked at this, he had to step back and say himself, there was nothing found inappropriate between Hancock and these lobbyists. And actually, we have some very strict and strong firewalls between the administration, elected officials, and the lobbyists. And so 
I also, he also know that I over report when I receive gifts. I don't care if it's a coffee or breakfast. I typically come back, we record it, and it's submitted as part of my annual report. Um, but you, you know what? These lobbyists, when they found themselves on trip, are actually working. We work. I don't see them most of the time because my track is much different than theirs when we're on these international excursions. We're about bringing business and opportunity back to the people of Denver and back to the businesses of the city, and we have been successful. You can't argue against the 12 direct flights to Denver, the increase in uh, direct foreign investment in Denver, Colorado, because of those efforts that we have combined. You don't do this by yourself. You see a turtle on the fence, you got to know someone helped him get there. Denver was revitalized because of the efforts and partnership with all of our partners in every sector, including those lobbyists who represent those companies who went about the process of taking risks, hiring people, and helping to move this economy forward. Thank you, Jamie. Your biggest owner is a big developer in this mm -hmm. city. 25% of your total donations have come from Kyle Zeppelin, who did have a run-in with the city um, over not making good on some affordable housing commitments. It's not illegal for him to champion your mm -hmm. election, but do you see where voters might wonder if he will curry some special favor with you should you become mayor? Yeah. Um, I, I want to start, I, I do want to start by kind of building off of um, some of the comments that, that Mayor Hancock made. But I do want you to and address And I will address yours. it. Okay. I will address it. Um, you know, the mayor talked about his, his long work as a politician in the city. And I think what I, I need to share directly with the voters is first and foremost, I'm not a politician. Um, I haven't been part of the inside circle here in Denver. Um, I am an outsider. I moved here 13 years ago. I moved here for the quality of life. I married a Denver native. I have a nine-year-old in DPS. This city is my city. And it's important for me, for people to know that I got in this race because I've got an urban planning background. I've worked with developers. I've worked with business owners. I've worked with residents, with neighborhood associations. And I've done a lot of work with the city. But I've done it from a pure place of compassion, working with nonprofits, working with community organizations. And I got in this race because I think we need a change. Now, the Zeppelin family did a significant um, amount of work with me, as did many other property owners while I was working in River North over the course of a few years. And for me, when I got into this race, you know, I, I wasn't, I was interested in trying to change city leadership. Um, a year ago at this time, I didn't know I was running for mayor. I, 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 it, it's a process that evolved after conversations and thinking, you know what, we just need to get in there and have that conversation. I, I didn't do that. I didn't take that decision lightly of disrupting my life. I got married last summer. I'm a newlywed. Um, I have a family. Um, I have my parents living with me. I mean, it's, there's a lot. And so I went in asking around to say, if I get in, I, need, I, know, I, I know that I need support. I know that I need financial support to take on an incumbent. And they and many other people were there. Um, I have done an incredible job fundraising against an incumbent mayor. So I don't hold any special place for anybody in my administration. The Zeppelins or Penfield Tate or Lisa Calderon who are now supporting me, there is, there is nothing there. But I will surround myself with a lot of diverse voices and the best people in a lot of different ways to make decisions. But I think the fact that I'm not a politician and I'm not beholden, nor do I really even know lobbyists or anybody else, sets an opportunity for us to really direct a new future with a lot of different and diverse voices at the table. Eric, you're next for next question. I think I'm gonna follow up and build on uh, Sean's question. And the subject concerns the city's code of ethics. Mm -hmm. um, let me, even though we're a little out of order, I'm going to start with you, Michael, on this one. Mm -hmm. I've heard from some sources on the city's board of ethics that they were disappointed that they perceived you were less than supportive of some strengthening of the code of ethics to bring it more in line with cities such as Chicago, uh, more aligned with Chicago, Philadelphia, and some other even larger cities than Denver, although I'm not sure any of us would regard Chicago as a mm. <laughs> <laughs> exemplar exactly. of uh, My question is, A, is that a legitimate concern on their part? And B, do you think the city's code of ethics needs strengthening and would that be a part of your third term or your first term? You know what, I don't know exactly what they're speaking about. I don't <laughs> remember any specific instance where I pushed back on something that they wanted to do. 
Um, and, and, you know, we work very, I work very closely with my city attorney to address the issues around the ethics commission. Um, but I will tell you what I am forced, uh, uh, forced to do as, as all elected officials, and that is to report everything that we do. And I am more than, I comply with it happily. I think it's very important that people know what we're doing through a very uh, open lens of, uh, of transparency. Um, oftentimes I'm told you over report. I know our city attorney says you don't have to report that. I'm like, we're gonna report it anyway. Um, if it's only a few dollars, I have a friend who got angry with me because I reported a hat he gave me for five dollars and he said, it's was much more than that. But I do support <laughs> keeping a strong, a forceful, enforceable ethics policy in the city of Denver and making sure that as we go along if we're strengthening it. Um, so I can't speak specifically to an instance that you might be referring to, Eric. Uh, there may have been where our city attorney may have had questions, uh, but I can't speak to a particular incidence where, instance where I'm like that we don't want to do that. Jamie, is the current code sufficient or do you need, does it need to be changed? I have heard from several people that feel there are places where the code needs to be changed. And certainly I think it's, it's critical as um, a leader of a city like this that um, we are constantly updating and, and ensuring that we are staying on top of um, ethics issues. I think it's also imperative that we are looking at how are we um, dealing with um, how our employees can report against each other or against, uh, you know, against issues that happen maybe with superiors, for example. Um, we know that there, you know, the mayor has said there is a, a reporting system in place, but city employees have said it's not particularly effective or strong. They still fear retaliation when those types of things come up. Um, how we deal with issues of harassment. Um, I think that these are critical issues given what has happened under the last eight years of this administration that we need to be willing to tackle head on and be very open and transparent with a continuous conversation of how do we do better to serve our people. We need to have ethical leadership at every level of government. Sure. Thanks. So Denver became the first city to decriminalize magic mushrooms this past election. Jeff Hunt, director of the Centennial Institute at Colorado Christian University, said of that vote, Denver's becoming the illicit drug capital of the world. Do you think this vote hurts the city's image? And we'll start with you, Jamie. Well, I, you know, out on the campaign trail, I certainly heard some concern that are, we're moving fast in this, in this uh, new era of um, being more welcoming to drugs of all types. And I think there's a lot of concern about what the impact is on the, the community. Um, ultimately, the voters passed it. And I think that we have to look now at how we actually work with the community, work with police to ensure that we uphold the will of the voters but recognizing what the unintended consequences may be and that we're prepared for those. Um, you know, I asked the question leading up to the election and I, I didn't get a firm answer, but I did reach out to DPD and say, how many arrests actually happen on an annual basis for magic mushrooms? And there are, there are relatively few in the grand scheme of things of the other drug issues. Mm -hmm. But I think we're still likely to see some unintended consequences and I, I don't know what the intent of the people that put the, the ballot measure up is, um, but you know the steps that were taken with marijuana were first to decriminalize and then to legalize. So that could be something that is on the horizon that we'll have to be ready to confront. But does it hurt Denver's image? I don't know if it hurts Denver's image. I, I, you don't think so? I, I think people are concerned about, people in our community, there's, there's some people that are concerned about it. Um, but I think we have a job to do to to make sure we get out in front of that and we're saying this is this is how we're going to work with police and work with our community to make sure this doesn't negatively impact our community. Michael, what do you think about what Jeff Hunt said? Yeah, you know what, uh, Sean, that's a great question. I think Jeff's point is right on target. You know, when we went to implement recreational marijuana, we were surprised to find out we were only the first city, the first city in the world to actually legalize and implement legalized marijuana. I actually had a conversation with the mayor of Amsterdam, the director of safety of Amsterdam, and the director, the police chief of Amsterdam. And I remember talking to them and saying, you know, tell me how you did this. Legalized or implemented legalized recreational marijuana. And they looked at me and they said, we've never legalized <laughs> recreational marijuana. 
And I said, you kidding me, man? I, mean, I said, literally, I walked through eight plumes of marijuana on my way here to have this conversation with you. <laughs> and they, they never implemented recreational marijuana. They tolerated recreational marijuana. Then the mayor said something to me that goes straight to Jeff's point, Sean. He said, Mayor, I'm going to talk to you mayor to mayor. And I don't want you to ever forget this. Remember who Denver is and fight like hell to maintain that image. He said, because today we have the image of being the marijuana capital of the world. That's not the image we want. And we're spending an inordinate amount of resources, people resources and money to change that image. Once you lose it, you very seldomly get it back. So no matter what you all do, make sure you do everything you can to protect your image as, as the destination for tourism and mountains and outdoor active lifestyle and great quality of life. And as the only mayor in this, in this race, or any, only person in this race who's actually taken and implemented a wholesale industry for the first time in the world, I can tell you that this, was, this is a problem. We don't want the image of being the place that tries everything first for, before everyone else. And we don't want to be the city that everyone said, that's where you go for all of the drugs that might be on Schedule 1 on the federal government list, and you can do it. We've done well with marijuana. The sky didn't fall, as we all, many of us predicted, under the marijuana uh, industry. Um, but we don't want to keep doing this. And I'm concerned about uh, philocybin uh, mushrooms that are now uh, legalized. But how we do this, we'll follow the same blueprint, and we'll follow the will of the people. Uh, but we as a people have got to tune in and understand we don't want this image as being a place where we're, going willing, we're willing to try everything for the first time for the rest of the world. Can I just, can I just add a comment on? Sure. Um, and first of all, I just want to clarify, you said legalize, but it's decriminalize. It, they, it, we did not legalize the magic, the psilocybin. Yeah. Um, but the image thing I think is important, important to note on that, you know, uh, uh, what, I think it was six months ago or so that the, in Kansas City they reported that um, they were scared about the Denverification of Kansas City. And it was all based upon development and growth and gentrification and how people were being impacted. So when we talk about image, um, and I, I, get, I, I get that image is an important thing, but at the end of the day, also important is taking care of people. And the people in Kansas City who are looking at Denver saying, my God, we don't want to become that, aren't saying that necessarily because of the magic mushrooms or the marijuana. They're saying that because the cost of living, the ability to have a family and a life and afford all the things that, that one wants um, uh, is, is become very hard here. And we haven't taken care of people. So I think that's an image issue that we have to fight as well. I'll tell you an image that we don't want, an image where almost double digit unemployment is existing in the city of Denver an image where you have mass foreclosures on whatever block, almost every block in the city of Denver, particularly in communities of color uh, and low-income communities. Uh, we also don't want parks dying, you don't want roads crumbling, and you don't want zero jobs in the city of Denver. We've been able to advance this city. The next term has got to be about balance. We thrive like no one's business, we grew like no one's business. I'm going to repeat what I said earlier. As mayor and as an experienced policymaker, I much rather manage the challenges of growth than the challenges of a dying city. I don't want to move to Kansas City, so I don't want them to be Denverfication either. Uh, Denver has some of the most natural, beautiful assets and why people come here. We're active year round. You can't be active year round around Kansas City. We have the highest level quality of life. Kansas City doesn't even come close to Denver, Colorado. You don't have, we have a great economic opportunity for whoever comes back. And as a father of young adults, I'm proud that they were willing and are willing to come back to Denver, Colorado to begin their lives and their careers. You can't choose to do that in some cities in America today. You can choose to do that in Denver, Colorado today with a 3% unemployment rate. In essence, we have more jobs than we have people. There are challenges in this city. I'm not blind to them. I grew up in this city. I have children, nephews, and nieces, and brothers and sisters challenged by this economy. But the reality is, let's address them while we have progress and pro prosperity Managing the challenges of growth versus managing the challenge of a dying city. I'll take it any day. And as someone who's been in Denver all my life, I can tell you this is the type of economy we prefer while we address these challenges going forward. Eric, you're up next for next question. I suspect that next to growth and congestion and mm -hmm. everything that entails, the biggest issue on the mind of many voters here is that of homelessness. Mm -hmm. In terms of what the previous uh, responses you just gave, I also think homelessness is starting to threaten the image of Denver. I look at a number of West Coast cities from LA up the coast to Seattle, 
where homelessness is almost becoming definitional for some of those cities these days and impacting the quality of life. We'll start with you on this one, Michael, but I'm just curious. I mean, I clearly what we're doing at present isn't the answer or isn't the complete answer. Right. What does this look like and how do we not lose the city in the process? Eric, I think when we talk about homelessness, I think oftentimes people forget a lot of the uh, uh, extenuating circumstances around homelessness. But let me just say this very clearly. There is nothing more important to me personally as someone who's been homeless uh, and the people who I know who've been homeless and I've walked the streets and talked to the homeless than to make this issue one of the top priorities of this city and to start with housing our homeless first. The extenuating circumstances that I allude to is that we have an absolute uh, drug epidemic in the city of Denver and across this nation. Opiates, particularly met, not, not as an opiate, but a methamph methamphetamines are Denver's biggest challenge in terms of drugs on our streets, as well as mental health. Here's what we've done to address it. We have helped house 7,800 people in the city of Denver uh, since I've become mayor in this Denver, and, and permanently. And we have introduced some of the most innovative programs, including our social impact bond program, where we not only house people in permanent supportive housing, but we wrap them with intensive services around with mental health and drug and alcohol uh, rehabilitation services. Secondly, we have expanded the number of shelter beds in the city of Denver, and we're going to continue to work and create opportunities around our tiny homes opportunities. That's why we did an inventory and found city-owned land so we can create a more, greater stable situation for that tiny home village, and we're going to look for other opportunities around the city of Denver. NIMBYism is real, and so when we move in to address them, you saw what happened uh, in, in uh, the Globeville area, Swansea community. We're going to try to move to other cities with tiny home village, uh, neighborhoods, but we expect there will be challenges. But housing people first, putting mental health workers in the cars with police officers to help to break that very expensive cycle and move people into direct services as opposed to jail. Keeping, yes, our home, our uh, urban camping ban in place. Uh, you know, Jamie has said, I don't support I-300, but yet I would repeal the, the uh, urban camping ban. That, you might as well support it, I-300, because what you're going to see are, are campsites all over city of Denver because you've taken away a vital tool of the city of, Gun city of Denver all of our agencies that we partner with to help move people to direct services. That is not in place to criminalize people as some of the activists like to say. It's not about criminalizing people. In fact, we've only had about 30 citations and three arrests and they were not related to camping out. They were related to felonies that people had as we moved in to try to d direct them. But you take away a very progressive tool that allows us to move people to direct services and to make sure we are able to address public health challenges created by these encampments. So the reality is this. We got to keep doing what we're doing as well as continue to try to learn innovative steps. What we've seen over the last three years, Eric, is a decrease in the number of homeless on our streets, but we got to remain vigilant. Sorry for the long answer, but I wanted to make sure you address. And Jamie, homelessness, yep. camping ban, and yeah. the rights not only of the homeless, but of property owners, business owners, homeowners, et cetera. Absolutely. And this is an issue that I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about and I have been engaged in and been involved in trying to find solutions over the last several years and that's what's informed my my take on this so i want to you know directly address um, and respond to the mayor's comments about initiative 300 and the urban camping ban it's incredibly important that we understand what that is and what the differences are i was a hard no from the beginning on initiative 300 and i stand firm with that i voted against it and that's where i am Initiative 300 was not a simple repeal of the camping ban. Initiative 300 went way farther than that. It truly took away our rights to engage with the homeless community. It allowed individuals to sleep or camp pretty much anywhere on public space, to park their cars anywhere and sleep in them. It was not good. And it would have really tied our hands up in terms of being able to get people to services. So Initiative 300 wasn't an answer. It was bad policy. But in my mind, it was bad policy on top of bad policy that we have. The urban camping ban um, was put in place during the Occupy Denver movement. And to say that if we repeal it, we'll have tents everywhere all over the city, we have tents everywhere all over the city. They're there. In the seven years since we have had the camping ban in place, our homeless populations, our encampments have grown significantly. And we've spent millions. Yes, we have only ticketed a handful of people. I get that. But we have spent millions on policing and sweeping. And that's what that camping ban was intended to do. Millions, mind you, that could have been redirected 
towards the housing first model. And in the last few weeks this is the first time I've heard the mayor say that, though I have been talking about housing first as a solution that other cities have deployed. Get people to housing, get people to housing with supportive services that need them. That's how you start to tackle the problem. So for me, repealing the camping ban isn't about repeal the camping ban and that's a solution. That is to say that's a bad policy. It has done nothing for us but cost us money. We've been sued over it. We're likely to be sued over it again. So stop putting in policy that puts us in a bad place. Start investing those resources in getting homeless people to housing and services. And the immediate opportunity we have is to move folks to temporary services. And there's any number of solutions from tiny homes, uh, from uh, you know sanctioned camping sites, from working to turn our day shelters into 24-7 shelters. We have to figure out what we can do most quickly and most cost effectively and then be able to deploy those services. But we have to actually start investing. And um, one last point on this that I would ask if the mayor could clarify, we have $14 million set aside in the budget. In previous debates, you've said we're actually spending 50, then there was an article in the paper a few weeks ago that said it's actually $60 million a year we're spending on mm -hmm. homelessness. To be spending $60 million and see the problem getting this much worse, um, I think is, is, is a hard pill to swallow. So where are those resources going? Um, great question, and I'm glad you asked it, but let me, let me address a, an issue that um, you raised that I believe con you contradict yourself with regards to I-300 and, and the urban camp ban. It did go much further than just whether or not we, we forbid encampments. It also would have forbid it, forbid it, forbade our law enforcement officers from approaching the the uh, the uh, the residents of encampments. That's right. I three hundred. Right. I three hundred would have. The urban camping ban is about outreach. It's about a progressive process to move those encampments going in, with outreach workers, navigators, directing people, connecting people with services. It has never been about sweeping people. When we go in, we're addressing public health challenges. We have found some of the most unspeakable things in some of these encampments that are a threat to the homeless as well as the general public. And so, yes, we have to address the issue, and the urban camping ban helps us. This is where my experience over the last year has helped me, as opposed to you studying or reading about homelessness and not engaging on the issue. The reality is, is that you go out there and you see these things, and you know we need a tool within the city government that allows us to move forward. If you study the cases, particularly out of California, Los Angeles, Los Angeles has 20 blocks of encampments because they've made the mistake of not having a progressive policy in place to move encampments and they were moving people without a place to go. Denver does not move in unless I say I have a bed for you to go to right now if you want it and we have services right now to direct you to help you stabilize your life whether mental health or they are they are drug and alcohol rehabilitation services or housing so we can get people connected. If we get you and we get you in we're able to help you and we prove time and time again that we're able to do that. You saw some of those folks who were part of the anti-300, who were homeless themselves, saying, thank God, no one brought forward the, 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 the lacking of compassion suggestion that I go sleep outside, but instead leaned in to help me. That's the difference between I-300 and the urban camping ban. Let me finish, because you asked a question about where that money is. Cities like Seattle today spend five times what Denver spends on homelessness. They spend a billion dollars. Their homeless challenge is much worse than Denver, Colorado. It's not about money, it's about partnerships. So when you ask where $60 million is, go to Denver Health and find their 24-7 drop-in center for those who are homeless, who are suffering from methamphetamine and opiate epidemic that the city of Denver is funding. If you wanna know where the money goes, go to Colorado Homeless for the Housing and ask them where did some of the money, how'd you help, how'd you build some of this housing that you're now housing people? Who pays for the soft services on the ground that you're providing for the people here in Denver, Colorado? Go to the rescue mission, ask about the $11 million uh, day shelter that they have available uh, today. That's the city of Denver leaning in partnerships. So when you ask, and yes, human services as well, where we have people who are ready and who are, who are uh, prepared to, to deal directly with the homeless. So it's all over the city of Denver. You're looking at one line item when we have, have, we have pockets of appropriations in different departments. Mm -hmm. I just want to add on to that, I, just to clarify, again, I, I didn't, I'm not supportive of 300. But the camping ban, I mean, you talk about public health. Well, we have tools already um, that we can go address if there's a public health hazard. Um, you already can't set up camp on a 
public right of way and stay there blocking public right of way on a, on a sidewalk. So there are tools in place to do this. Um, the camping ban did go so far, if you read the language, as to say, basically, you can have the clothes on your back and nothing else. So we have used it to take people's stuff over the years and throw it out. And that's the sort of thing that has gotten us into legal trouble. So again, I just want to reiterate, there are still tools to address where homeless are to make sure that we are moving them to services. This was a tool that was faulty and it hasn't actually worked that effectively and it's cost us a lot to do that. That's the only reason I say we need to look at better policy and better tools to replace it and getting to a housing first and services first model. Which we have, our, our model is housing first and, and Jamie, you keep talking about new tools, new services. What are you speaking of specifically? I wanna hear, tell the people what your plan is specifically around housing or dealing with the homeless so they can understand because right now you've got a city 60 million people are asking away. It seems like we got more homeless and actually three years we've been decreasing. We've housed 7, 800 people. We're addressing mental health with our co-responder program and we're addressing um, our drug and alcohol addiction through Denver Health and in partnership with other uh, providers, including mental health of, of Denver. What is your plan that is different from what we're doing? It's, it's, you haven't invested enough with, I, I think in terms of the partnerships with actually getting people to a place where we can deliver service to them. So I know you say you're offering services as you go in, but a lot of those people are being swept and moved and moved and moved. They're losing their stuff, they're losing their paperwork. Um, and it's, it's impossible. It's impossible to get any level of stability when that is the, the way we go. We haven't created a, a place for people to go if they are on the street and they don't have housing where they can get showers and bathrooms and yes, services we have. and connected. rescue mission the partners but that we they have they go in they don't take everybody they don't take everybody well, we understand and they that. don't have enough room and oftentimes yep. you have to line up to get in and you have to line up to get in the next day and you know there isn't it isn't a solution people when you talk about housing it's not about more shelter beds it's about housing we need I, to I, get people you're into talking uh, place Jamie to live. I know it's about housing I've been homeless I know I, housing I there's no greater security than a roof over someone's head I understand that but when I'm talking about someone tonight I need to get you in the shelter so we can connect you with services you're talking around long range housing is very important for people and, and and so when you talk outside of, of of making sure we can take care of you right now at this very moment shelter is what we have but we got to get you in so we can connect you to services no rescue mission can't take everyone but that's why salvation army is there that's why saint francis is there that's why colorado homeless for the housing is there that's why that's why uh, catholic charities are there so i mean we can go on with this all day but the reality is and that you're talking big picture you're talking symbolic uh, themes but you're not in the game in terms of understanding how we have to go and out i've every talked day. with all those organizations Let's and none of them none of them think we're doing enough I think, I think we could probably go on for another couple hours on homelessness, uh, clearly in Denver. Uh, let's keep going, Sean, with the next question, okay. new topic. We're talking about how we spend money. I think we're starting with Jamie this one. So um, you want to bring back streetcars. <laughs> um, millions, maybe tens of millions of dollars to do this would disrupt neighborhoods. What would, what would be the return on that kind of investment? Isn't there better places, homelessness, uh, to spend some of this money? Yeah, I, it's a great question. And what I want to start with with that is I've talked about the need to invest in a, in, in a well-connected, well-operated intra-city transit network. And the reason that that is critical, I'm not saying we have to sit here and prioritize homelessness, affordable housing, transit. They're all important, right? And that's part of the challenge we have with, with the growth over the last eight years is congestion has reached a, a such a severe point that you know getting into and out of the city is challenging and ultimately that will continue to to choke our economy if we don't invest in alternate modes to move move people around the city so the intra-city transit piece is what's important to me um is that light rail uh no no well i mean we have a denver moves transit plan that start began to identify the corridors and the various options when you talk about streetcar i'm talking about um, a fixed rail system uh, versus, you know, tires and buses or bus rapid transit. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can build out the entire city on the streetcar network that Denver once had. I wish we could. That would be amazing. But the reality is, yes, the disruption of neighborhoods, et cetera. I think what makes sense is to look at streetcar as an option for our primary transit corridors, places like Broadway, like Spear, like Colorado, like Federal, where we have the room to have a mixed 
mixed modes on the street and where we also can provide opportunity and incentivize opportunity to encourage some development, both economic development in terms of businesses along those, uh, those lines, as well as housing on top. And that's just smart development strategy, tie it all together. Um, so I think streetcars is, is one tool in an arsenal, but we have seen in other cities that they bring a lot of value because they're fixed and because there's development potential there that makes a lot of sense in terms of directing where development should go. Mm -hmm. um, and they provide a great opportunity to move people um, and move masses of people faster. But ultimately, it's going to be a mix of modes. And honestly, all of it is going to have to go forward with the support of the community and likely a vote to determine how are we going to generate resources to invest in any form of intracity transit. So, Michael, you have laid out a $300 million mobility plan? Two billion. Two billion. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I thought 300 million sounded yeah. like a lot. So we it wish. sounds good. Yeah. How do you pay for that? Great question. And I think it's the same question that has to be answered with regards to the trolley car because there are three challenges with regards to what Jamie has proposed. One, you might recall that in 2008, 2000, about the time Jamie was arriving in Denver, we actually looked at trolley car along Colfax. And I, it was one of the issues during the 2011 election. Um, and uh, my opponent at that point was looking at it. And what we know is that it is two to three times more expensive than bus rapid transit, for example. Uh, it doesn't really connect people to neighborhoods. Um, and thirdly, interesting, you talk about development. The reality is that trolley cars are used as economic, as economic driver for areas that have to be revitalized. And so it causes gentrification. And so as you look at the study, that's one reason why we rejected it and said it really wouldn't connect people to neighborhoods and doesn't really connect people to the small businesses. We also know that along 16th Street malls, we just did a study that if you just move people along, they're not going to shop. They'll go to their destination and move on. So trolley cars don't work. The $2 billion really had a couple of points. One, what will be our local co uh, commitment? The voters of Denver started with the first down payment. We committed almost a half a billion dollars in the 2017 November general bond election uh, that is now being deployed. I also increased our general fund allocation by 30 percent for the uh, reconditioning maintenance of our roads uh, in Denver, infrastructure investments. And then we, I said very clearly in that 2017 State of the City address to the state and federal partners who have a responsibility to also be investing in a rose, we have a placeholder for you. And so we have played very aggressively at the state level in terms of lobbying for an infra infrastructure bill. And we did it with Obama and we're doing it with, uh, with uh, President Trump. And that is lobbying at the federal level for common sense infrastructure bill. And we work with our delegation because they have to help us fill these holes. But we're going to continue to make our investments as we go on forward. And here's the powerful thing about Denver. We are using what we have, reprioritizing resources and investing in our roads from that from that uh, from that direction and while we continue to look for other sources and opportunities to invest without adding additional taxes or fees on, on the on behalf of the people but we are moving 125 miles of bike lanes uh, reconnecting our sidewalk network bringing sidewalks where they don't exist bike lanes as I mentioned for making sure that we uh, are also investing like bus rapid transit along Colfax Avenue those are the things I think are going to be critical for us to make sure that people are able to uh, to let go of their steel wheels and then finally Sean one of the things that we're doing is um, that you talk about the intra network. When I announced the creation of the Transportation Infrastructure Department, something that we had worked on for two years, one of the real quiet issues that no one really picked up on was I gave them the authority to create a transit uh, a network, a transit district for themselves to do an overlay if necessary outside of RTD to do the intra network of uh, moving people from on the first last mile. I want to jump in for just a quick follow-up on that, and specifically about parking. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't give my vote to either one of you. I live in Highlands Ranch. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but when I, I think of the whole Yogi Berra thing, that I would love to come to Denver more often, but no one goes there anymore uh, because it's too crowded. <laughs> and it, my other choice is I can drive in like I want to do, or I can spend $5 a person on a light rail and take me an hour and a half to get here. I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. If I want to come to Denver, I want to enjoy all the great things in this great booming city, but I want to park my car. Am I being told, and sh whether you're, it's your administration uh, from now on or yours, Mayor Hancock, can I still drive my car and park somewhere in Denver? Mayor, I'm going to give it to you first. Yeah, I, I think so, but we're also trying to discourage uh, people driving into the city. This city grows by 23% every day. That's the net growth we have when people move, drive into the city. And unfortunately, more than 73%, more than 7 out of 10 people are coming in single occupant vehicles. We're trying to discourage 
people from bringing, bring, coming in on cars. And that's one reason why we were such a strong partner and we drove the regional transportation strategy known as Fast Tracks. Um, we got to continue to expand that and work on it. But the reality, if you're coming in out of Lakewood, if you're coming in out of Arvada or, or, or Westminster, um, Thornton, you know, we want you to be able to use the G line, the West line, and of course the A line uh, to get into downtown Denver. That will help all of us not only deal with congestion, but breathe healthier air. Jamie, do I need to learn to take the G line and the H line or anything else? Or can I park my car in Denver? You can still park your car in Denver. I think the important thing to note here is it's about it's about balance and it's about making sure that we're accommodating all the modes. You know, people are still going to need cars. Um, but it's about providing options and I think encouraging people to use transit in different ways. Again, I you know the the fast tracks investment was a great investment on a regional scale. But we need the, the connectivity within the city mm -hmm. to, to truly make transit a viable option for day-to-day -day life for people. And I think the other thing is just acknowledging what we're looking at is not forcing people to change habits necessarily, but we know it's going to take a while to build a transit network that works for people, is be providing those alternatives, especially for the day-to-day -day commuters, which is the really stressful part of the day is getting into and out of the city for work. But obviously for the average person bringing their kids in, wanting to go to the zoo or the botanic gardens, mm -hmm. we still need to accommodate you. And so that's just about balance and how we use our, our network most effectively. Eric, go for the next question. I'll start with you, Michael. I'll have a somewhat separate question for you, Jamie. As a political observer around here for probably too many years, it strikes me that third terms can often get stale. Yeah. I look back at my old boss mentor, Dick Lamb. He was yeah. distracted. Roy Romer, Wellington Webb. I'm thinking of people, and it's not that long a list of people who have served three terms in executive right. office. How do you keep a third Hancock term from, from getting stale? How do you keep it fresh? Eric, great question. You know. I've talked about this publicly, so it's not, no surprise. You know, I said, you know, I, I had, it was tough to decide to run for a third term. My wife one morning looked at me, she said, I know you're struggling. You've got to decide uh, what you're going to do with regards to a third term. The number one thing that I wanted to guard against was not having anything to do or being stale. Uh, but my wife challenged me. She said, I want you to think about what would make you passionate to get up every morning for four years, to stay in that fishbowl, and to be mayor of this, this city. And, and I started thinking that whole week, and I thought about it, and I said, you know what? We've got some great major projects, convention center expansion, airport expansion, uh, National Western, uh, the, hat, the, the billion dollar bond infrastructure projects. Uh, but it, it wasn't that. You know what got me excited was really the fact that we, throw it, we were in the recession, we thrived out of the recession in the second term, and the opportunity to bring balance and equity to our economy for people that I know personally who are still challenged in this economy, an economy that we have great opportunities and the, it, I'm, so I'm going back to really my grassroots days, my urban league, civil rights days, and saying, you know what, we've got to go and make sure that everybody can come along in this economy. It's the things that building housing, it's the mobility, and create, using mobility and housing really as an equalizer for those who live along the margins. Those are the opportunities that, quite frankly, get me very excited. It's about improving Denver human services so that no child uh, is vulnerable or in danger in the city and that we have a team that's ready to go and they're doing a phenomenal job. Uh, it's those things that get me most excited about a third term. So I'm, I'm extremely excited. And do I dare say also third and finally is to continue to connect this city around the world. Um, and I don't have to be around the world, but to continue to have conversation with airlines about the value of flying direct to Denver. And Jamie, for you, obviously, there would be a learning curve here. Mm. The mayor, whatever you make of his administration, he knows the levers of power in this city. Mm -hmm. I assume you'd have to learn those levers. Tell me what your learning curve would look like. Well, I, th I think it starts with just acknowledging I'm not a newbie to understanding how the city works. I've worked in some capacity. I've worked with the mayor's office. I've worked with council. I've worked with, I think, every single department within the city in some capacity. And I've worked with local governments around the country and around the world. So I get how the machine works, um, how the beast, as it were, works. So, um, I, you know, I look at it and I say, you know, the mayor has been a mayor under, under a really interesting set of circumstances and is talking about a third term that requires a different, a different sort of leadership, addressing a different sort of issues. And I think we have to question whether or not this administration, both the mayor and his leadership team, are in a mindset to lead in that different way. Um, what you've got with me is, 
is a fresh shot. I mean, it is, it is a bit of the unknown, but it is also a bit of an opportunity to recognize that I come in with no connections, with no ties to what has been, and with a real opportunity to build a team of the best and the brightest and people who understand the challenges of where Denver is now and how to lead us out of it. So um, I think it's a real, I think every time we look at opportunity and we take a risk, you can look at Federico Pena, you can look at um, you know, John Hickenlooper, people who came in and, and dove in head first to really tackle the issues. I think that's the opportunity we have here. I've always said an hour goes by very fast in the studio, hmm. and this has been no different. Uh, it's time for our closing statements. We're asking each of our candidates to give a 30-second closing statement. We flipped the coin before the debate began. Uh, Michael, you'll go first for your 30-second closing statement. You know, this election is critical for Denver. Great cities do not stall or pause their progress. I said a couple times tonight, I'd much rather as mayor of this city manage the challenges of growth than to manage a dying city. Denver is not a dying city. In that sense, Denver is actually a great city. But it has its challenges, and we're not blind to that. Having grown up in this city, having been a child of this city, having gone through the, the opportunities and the ups and downs of this great city, I wake up with Denver in my blood. I'm committed to Denver, and I know we have a great uh, opportunity in front of us. I would be honored to be your mayor for the next four terms so we can keep the progress of this city going forward and keep the momentum of addressing our challenges moving as well. Thank you. And Jamie, your 30-second closing statement. Thank you. A great city takes care of her people. That's the bottom line. It is the city's job to ensure that we are lifting everybody up as the city grows. And so while I understand that we have come out of a recession and, and grown into a thri thriving economic city, what I also recognize is that the city has left a lot of people behind and people are struggling to make ends meet and move around the city and struggling to recognize their Denver. So we have an opportunity to take hold and really redirect, really um, imagine what a great Denver can look like for everybody going forward. And I'd be honored to have everybody's vote on June 4th and to really take that opportunity and see what we can do together. Thank you, Jamie. I'd like to thank our candidates, Jamie Gillis and Michael Hancock. I'd also like to thank my fellow panelists, Sean Boyd and Eric Sondman. If you'd like to find out more information about any of this or any other runoff races, please visit our websites, cpt12.org, cbsdenver.com, and koanewsradio.com. For everybody here at Colorado Public Television, I'm Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you very much for watching. Good night.